Hi, everybody. My name is Gary Dunnett. I'm the Executive Officer of the National Parks Association, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's edition of our Connecting with Nature webinar series. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're all meeting on Aboriginal land. Um, I'm in southern Sydney on Darawal lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, today, we've got a returning speaker. In fact, he's um, on the league table. He's well and truly head and shoulders over everyone else. This is Matt's third um, edition of the Connecting with Nature series, but this is in fact the concentrated, fan-dried, um, oven-heated version of Matt, who's going to be talking to us about, um, I guess, one of the easily overlooked parts of uh, enjoying nature, which is how do you actually make sure you've got some decent tucker to take with you? So with no further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Matt. Oh, one thing I should do beforehand is just to note for, for those who haven't participated before, especially if you haven't been on Zoom before, if you just um, hover your mouse over the bottom bar, you'll see that there's a chat and a question, question and answer function. Um, generally speaking, if you've got a comment to make, by all means use the chat, but if you'd like to actually ask a question that um, Matt can address at the end of his presentation, um, it's best if you drop that into the question and answer section and we'll, we'll, I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. All right, thanks Matt, over to you. Uh, thanks, Gary. Thanks for that warm intro. Um, uh, I too would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on, which is uh, Darug, uh, and very close to Gurungai country. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to elders uh, past and present. Um, and uh, with some irony, I think, uh, talk about food, because for, for tens of thousands of years, um, people have walked this land and uh, found all the sustenance uh, they needed, that they manage the land extremely well cared for it um, and uh, country cared uh, for the people. Um, and so it would seem somewhat ironic, I think, <laughs> to talk about bushwalking uh, food uh, and not acknowledge how um, people have uh, walked this land and thought about these topics for a very long time, but in a very different context. Um, so um, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, as Gary said, my name's uh, Matt McDonald. I uh, have the great privilege of uh, working with many of the leaders uh, at the MPA um, uh, week in, week out to keep the activities program rolling uh, and get to uh, chat with many of our members. Um, uh, I also get uh, the great pleasure of uh, bushwalking. I've written uh, some books, run some websites and, um, uh, and get the, uh, the privilege of walking um, lots of different places around New South Wales and Australia. Um, and uh, I've got more and more interested in food, um, particularly as my stomach has grown um, over the last few years, um, um, and, uh, and particularly when taking my kids out uh, into the bush. Um, so uh, we've started a bit of a tradition, I guess, that every couple of years we go and do a, a longer walk. So we tend to spend somewhere between seven to 10 days on track uh, in the remote area. So, you know, the overland track kind of stuff. Um, um, we sometimes do snow trips and, and things like that. And one of the things I've found is that food is, um, uh, is something that changes the mood of a walk, <laughs> no matter what the weather's like, um, um, no matter how cranky you are after a really hard, long day, if you can sit down and enjoy a good meal together, it, it, it brings people together. So when I talk about food, um, I, I we'll talk a bit about nutrition and we'll talk about kilojoules and all those things are important to some degree, depending on the length of your walk. Um, but, um, but to me, it, it, it's a social, a social act as much as it is a biological act. Um, so uh, when I talk about some of this food stuff, some people might go, oh, Matt, you're getting way too carried away. That's way too much. Um, or you're putting way too much effort into that. And, and, and that might be true for many people. Um, but this is, um, I, I wanted to share how, how I like to do food um, and uh, if that works for you or if you can just take away some ideas from this um, then, then I think it's it's a worthy time. Uh, so for um, 
Uh, feel free uh, yeah, to write comments as we go, ask questions. Um, and look, we've got a lot of experienced people online. Um, so if you know the answer to some of the questions, please jump in um, and have the conversation and share your experience and stuff. Um, it's not all about me. Um, there's plenty of people here with um, lots more experience as, uh, in this space as, than me as well. So uh, please don't be shy. Please share those experiences. So what today's talk is on is... Um, uh, is, is I'm focusing on the idea of lightweight, cheap uh, and simple-ish meals. I've got a few ones in there that are a bit trickier. Um, I must admit, I do like to get a bit carried away on some trips and um, not to tease other walkers, but, but, I, but I do sometimes like the idea of doing something a bit extravagant and, um, um, and the kids love you know, doing something a little bit out there. Uh, we still haven't pulled off ice cream on a long walk, but we're really close. Um, we're going to talk about um, um, meals that you can do from supermarkets um, and also talk a bit about home dehydration. We're not going to talk about those packet freeze-dry meals that you buy from uh, camping stores. They're there, you know about them. If you want to do that, that's fine. I um, won't hold that against you. Um, it just doesn't work for me. They're, they're some $10 to $15 a pop. Um, and uh, for some people, that's fantastic. You can just grab it and go and not have to think about it. Um, um, but, I, but I enjoy the process of food as well. So uh, we're going to talk about general principles, uh, things and things to think about when it comes to food. You might think I'm getting a bit nerdy. I probably am. Uh, but let me indulge us as we go through this. And then we're going to talk specifically about some breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, uh, drinks, and the idea of a happy hour. Um, and at the end, um, I've got some links to Bushwalking 101, where we've got a bunch of recipes, heaps of ideas up there, as well as a, a link to a book um, uh, that Sonia wrote, who may be online, I'm not sure. Sonia, if you're online, please uh, feel free to uh, jump in in the comments section. I should have reached out to you beforehand. Um, but she's written a book on uh, gourmet outdoor cooking. Um, and so there's, there's, some, uh, there's a link to that as well. Um, so... When thinking about meals, um, these are just some stuff to think about. But we, we often jump straight to the idea of nutrition or cost, um, but, but I think it's more than that. So, so enjoyment is where I always start um, because to me, um, I want to not only enjoy the taste and the texture and the presentation, but it's got to sit within the goals of the walk. So um, for some walks where I'm just going, it's, I'm solo and I'm moving and I just want to keep going. I've had a really long day's walk. Enjoyment will probably mean really quick cooking um, and so that I can crawl into my tent or my hammock and, and, and get to sleep um, after a long, hard day. Um, on other trips, um, so like on the three capes, when I did the three capes, I did it solo, but I knew that I'd be meeting a lot of people. Um, so the idea of being able to share with strangers um, was important to me because I wanted to meet people on the walk. So, so these things will change and what's an enjoyable meal is beyond just the flavour. Um, so weight, um, we need to think about the weight of the ingredients, uh, the fuel, the prep equipment and uh, any waste that we're going to be generating. Um, so it's not just the, the raw ingredients. And I generally think about weight um, outside of the water needs for the, um, for the meal. Um, because generally speaking, my campsites will have water available. Um, but if you're, if you're walking in um, drier areas, um, then you'll need to also consider the, the extra water you need for that, um, which is the next point. Um, so the water, um, uh, you need to think about the water that's going into the food, the water that you need to prepare. So like if you're cooking something like pasta, um, you might use a litre of water to boil it, um, but you're actually only absorbing um, you know, 100 levels of that and the rest gets wasted. Um, um, in some settings, that's going to be a big deal um, because it's, it's a lot of water that you've had to carry. Um, so, so that kind of, you know, thinking about that water in those kind of needs um, and, and what water you're going to need for cleaning. Um, so a lot of the meals that I'm going to talk about, uh, particularly later in this, is um, stuff where I've got minimal amount of cleaning to do. I don't want to be sitting there scrubbing pots and stuff during the night. Uh, preparation uh, time in the field is important. I mentioned after some walks, um, you're just, just exhausted and you don't want to spend that time. But sometimes that time's really key. It's, it's a great time to be able to just sit around and chat and chopping and cutting and stirring um, and 
um, is part of that experience. So, um, so you know, time isn't necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's a really good thing. Uh, but thinking about that equipment that you need, how many pots, how many stoves, stirring things, serving things, again, the cleaning, the waste, the weather. Uh, when I talk about weather here, I'm, I'm thinking about um, if you're, if you're walking, you know, say you're on a walk that's 10 days long, um, you don't know what weather you're going to experience along the way. Um, and so how much is the weather going to impact in terms of your uh, meal prep? Um, um, you know, if you're cooking and you're cooking outside of a tent and there's no hut, um, then um, a big storm is going to have an impact on that experience of cooking. So, so um, I generally, particularly on longer walks, always have a couple of meals uh, that, that are quick and easy to cook um, or prepare that don't even need cooking um, for, for part of that reason. And the LNT is leave no trace. So thinking about uh, food waste um, and how much water you, you get rid of in terms of micronutrients. Hygiene's important. Um, how we store food and spoil risk, um, things like cheeses and some meat um, uh, expire easily uh, or quickly depending on the temperatures. Um, even if they don't, that, and things can spoil in different ways. Some things can spoil in a way that will make you sick and some things can spoil in a way that just makes them unpleasant. Um, so, um, you know, for example, if you're carrying a loaf of bread and it gets used as a pillow and gets squashed, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's just not as much fun to eat. Um, things might go rancid where it's not going to make you sick. It's not very enjoyable, you know, the, the taste is awful, uh, but things can obviously also make you sick. So thinking about that um, and how we carry and store food and what, what we can carry for a length of time. And again, we'll talk a bit about dehydration that deals with a lot of that. Um, and of course, we need to think about nutrition. So for a short walk, for a couple of days, um, or, you know, for a day walk or for a, um, you know, two, one or two nighter, nutrition doesn't really matter. Your, your bodies carry a lot of store. Um, and um, your body will work it out um, unless you've got um, particular medical conditions that need to be considered about. Um, um, but, but for the, long, the longer the trip, once you're out for more than three or four days, it's really important to start thinking about nutrition um, and in particular energy. Um, so energy, um, the, the amount of energy in the food is really important. Otherwise, you'll start to lose weight. Um, which for me is probably a good thing at the moment. Um, um, but those micronutrients become really important too after, you know, sort of four or five days or something like that. Um, and um, experimentation. I, I really encourage experimenting with food. Um, uh, it's a really good thing to do on trips. So think about that as part of your consideration. Um, but my suggestion is do one experiment per trip. Um, don't make every night an experiment because <laughs> it can go horribly wrong and you can get very hungry if, if you have a few fail failures in a row. Um, but enjoy mucking around with experiments and, and, and do that sort of stuff. Um, and if it's a particularly risky experimental food, um, then, uh, then maybe have some backup meals there as well. I always carry an extra meal, um, uh, at least an extra one. For longer trips, I'll carry a few extra nights of food. Um, so it's always good to have that. Um, my backup meals tend to be really simple, um, flavorless things, just very lightweight and easy to carry. Um, and that can be repaired without um, cooking. Um, so uh, we teased a bit about the idea of gourmet uh, meals and um, you don't always need to go gourmet. Um, again, sometimes you just need to get that food into you and um, get to bed. Um, but, but it can be really fun um, to spend some time out there and, and get a bit carried away with meals and with food preparation and with food presentation, um, and particularly on long trips. Um, so I think I'm, um, one of my talks is on the Overland track. And we talked about the idea that I was out for uh, Christmas and my wife's birthday on one trip um, we're out for 10 days and so we had two significant celebrations that were important to um, and and it was my family plus my sister and her kids so there were seven of us on that trip um, and so I really wanted to make at least those two nights a very special meal um, and so we got really carried away quite ridiculously carried away um, and and, and uh, um, but but it was really good fun and and it's memorable and stuff that the kids still talk about uh, in fact, we were at Peely and Hut for one of those nights, for those people who know the Overland track. And I ducked back in um, with uh, my niece about a week later 
uh, into the hut and we got there and um, somebody was telling us as we got here, oh, you should have been here a week ago. There was this family who had all this and started talking about our food. Um, the story had grown somewhat. Uh, it became quite more epic than what it actually was, but it was a bit of fun to hear about it. Um, so you don't always need gourmet. Uh, just briefly talking about how much food to carry. It, it's, it can be hard. Um, most people carry too much food on walks um, uh, because you tend to throw in a lot at the end for short walks. That's absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. You can over cater and uh, it doesn't particularly matter. For long walks, once you're out there for more than a week, um, over catering becomes a real hassle. Uh, but as a general rule, um, your hunger, hunger will obviously vary over the trip. And my experience is that most people tend to find the first few days, their appetite actually reduces. And then after that, it, it picks up and actually goes higher than what it normally is at home. Um, so I tend to use soups as buffers, um, just a packet of soup, um, just the sort of instant top soups um, and carry those so that if after the meal, still hungry or somebody in my group still hungry, um, we've got that soup there that, that tends to carry you over. So rather than over catering, I tend to have these sort of little buffer things that are nice and lightweight. As a general rule, the amount of kilojoules you need for a walk is quite extraordinary. It's between 9,000 to uh, 15,000 kilojoules a day, depending on how, how much you're walking and how much weight you're carrying. Um, so uh, it's a lot. Um, uh, now, um, it also depends on your goal. Um, if you're someone like me who's carrying extra weight, that's the third time I've mentioned that I'm overweight, I should stop doing that. Um, um, then losing weight is probably a good thing, um, but um, but but that's not uh, you know it's not necessarily the goal for your walk. So so have a have a think about that. And I'll just pop up here an example of a one day menu for one person um, where you can get in. What have we got here? Fourteen thousand uh, kilojoules, um, and, and that's seven hundred and forty grams. So it's not a lot of weight. Um, and it's quite a variety of food there. So, um, you know, hot chocolates and a muesli or a porridge is, tends to be how I start the day. Um, if it's a colder season in a summer, uh, warmer season, I'll probably go an iced tea, uh, something like that. I'm not a coffee or tea drinker, but others will do that. I tend to have a sports drink powder mix that I add uh, during the day, um, or sometimes I use uh, an iced tea rather than that, uh, again, a powder mix. Then sort of your Vita wheat sandwich with something like a tuna on it, um, you can get in 2000 kilojoules quite easily. Corn chips are just, um, your, are a powerhouse. Um, they're, they're a really lightweight, of, light way of getting a lot of energy in. Um, and I really like, really like the, the salty um, corn chips. So again, you need plenty of water to um, wash down salty foods. So um, be mindful of that. Um, but nuts and lollies are a great way of um, and dried fruit or dried mango tends to be how I go. Little salami sticks are good. Um, I should be holding some of these things up as I go. So uh, these little salami sticks type uh, things, uh, I find really handy that they last forever off the shelf. You can get different spicy amounts um, and um, a good um, some dried uh, mango. Uh, excuse my blurry thing. Um, and, um, and then your main meal tends to be your largest uh, energy intake for the day, tends to be the best time to have your large energy intake so, so you can digest it overnight um, and not have the lethargy, well, you benefit from the lethargy um, that you come from digesting a larger meal. And then that hot chocolate or soup, um, and then a dessert of some kind, and we'll go through some examples of these. Um, so when, feeding larger groups. This photo in the background was um, sort of laid out in day strips uh, for a trip I did um, with the kids and my wife over, I don't know, seven days or something like that. Um, and um, so, so there was a fair bit of work in pre preparing this. It probably took me a day or two of mucking around um, whilst at home, not full time, day or two, but you dry, you've got stuff in the dehydrator and you're packaging things up and you're putting it out. Um, so, uh, and there's a reasonable amount of work in it. The first time you do a big meal like this in terms of feeding a larger group, um, it takes a fair bit of brain power. 
Um, but once you've done it a couple of times, it becomes quite easy and it becomes second nature because you can revisit your, your previous ones. Um, and one of the biggest hints I can give you, if you're looking at feeding larger groups, is write down everything. You forget really quickly. Um, oh, what did we do last trip? Oh, we fed, I think it was six people and it was, oh, how much did we, how much, you know, all that sort of stuff you forget. Whereas if you can flip back and have a look at it, um, uh, you can quickly go, oh, this trip I'm feeding 10. Last time I did six and we used, you know, 600 grams. So this time I need a kilo. Um, so it takes away you having to rethink all that sort of stuff. So not everybody here is going to be feeding large groups, um, but here's some tips if you're going to do it. Um, the first thing is um, don't. <laughs> don't. Don't go to the larger groups unless you really want to. Um, encourage people to cook their own meals. There's a lot of benefits in that. People get to, um, um, you know, to eat what they want. Um, they um, get to eat when they want. Um, if, if you're in a group and you're walking for a few days, you, you might split out and have separate lunches and that sort of stuff. Um, but there are times where it's really good uh, to eat as a larger group. And so on some trips, I will often just say, look, I'll, I'll look after dinner on the first night for everyone. Um, and we'll, we'll, you know, I'll cook nachos or something like that on the first night, um, just as a way of bringing everyone together. Um, but then people will cater for themselves for the rest of the trip. Um, but when it's fam you know, when I'm feeding my kids and stuff, obviously, uh, I'm not going to, at this stage, they're a bit too young to us and to feed them, uh, cook themselves, although that's going to change soon enough. So if uh, catering larger groups, um, I would encourage DIY breakfasts and snacks. Um, basically, um, people, when they wake up in the morning, some people need food straight away. Um, some people want to pack up their tent and their bag and then have food just as they hit the trail um, and, um, and stuff like that. So what I tend to do when I'm feeding a larger group is give everybody their breakfasts uh, at the start of the walk. They carry them, they carry their snacks. Um, and then each morning I just have, um, I use a jet boil um, for most trips where I'm catering. Um, and just boil up some water. I show everybody how to use it so they can boil up their water and have that available so that they can have breakfast when they want. Um, and I'm also thinking about how do we minimise um, the amount of washing up uh, in the morning because um, you, you don't want to get stuck in camp for ages and, and delay your start. Um, so uh, things, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later, but, but one thing you can do with breakfast is keeping it really simple so you're just eating out of a cup. Um, and you can just rinse that off um, once you're finished or some people eat out of plastic bags. Um, lunches, um, again, happy uh, to cater for larger groups there, uh, but I, I like it. To, I like to, to have the flexibility of being able to split it um, so that when we, um, so as a group, you're probably not going to walk in a group of seven or 10 the whole day. You might split into two groups. Um, so making that easy uh, for lunch uh, and thinking about, particularly for lunch, is will this meal work in high winds, in wet weather, um, um, or, or snow? Um, so if not, do you change the meal or do you pack a shelter that you can quickly um, put up at lunch uh, for that? Uh, for dinners, um, you really want to minimise weight if you're responsible for catering for everyone. If you're catering for everyone, it doesn't mean you have to carry everything. Please don't. Please share the load. Um, but but, but it gives you a, a huge opportunity to, to reduce weight significantly across the whole group. Um, there's something about when you cater for 10, it's, it's just the total weight. You know, you, you're carrying the stove, you're carrying this pot, you're carrying this food, um, but you still need to think about those things. Um, I do something that some people will find a bit controversial, uh, but for large groups, um, I rehydrate. So I dehydrate my own food. We'll talk a bit about that. But I rehydrate the meals in freezer bags. Freezer bags, ironically, handle high temperatures much better than your standard snap lock or other plastic bags. Freezer bags can um, handle temperatures into the mid 100s quite well. So boiling water is absolutely fine in a plastic in a plastic freezer bag. So instead of carrying three billies, one for rice and one for you know all these other things, I cook and dehydrate my rice at home. I put it into um, a freezer bag. And I add enough hot water over the top of it and I just seal it off, uh, tie a slip knot in it, wrap it up in my jumper uh, and just let that sit for 10 minutes and the rice is ready. 
um, and uh, I'm not boiling rice and I'm not trying to clean the pot afterwards and um, going through a ton of fuel and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it means we can have a separate rice and separate curry because the curry will do the same thing. Um, and you can and you can cook for a really large group with just a single one liter jet boil. Um, so I I personally find that a really good way. And with the freezer bags, you can rinse them out and reuse them or uh, bring them home and recycle them um, as well. Um, also think about serving how you're going to actually get the food out to people. So people obviously need their own plates, knives, forks, spoons. Um, um, but um, when you're serving the meal out, um, you know, think about what serving equipment uh, you might need. Um, and desserts are great, uh, and we'll have some dessert ideas, um, but they often need to be uh, at least started the prep uh, before um, uh, before dinner. So again, thinking about your equipment needs and that sort of stuff, and thinking about the cleanup. Okay. I know it's all a bit nerdy thinking about some of this stuff, um, but um, we'll, we'll get into some meals now. Um, it, this is what um, uh, this is up on Bushwalking 101, and we call it the, the quadrant approach to meal design. Um, and it is a really um, so. If I take a step back, I'm not one to follow a recipe. Uh, I've got nothing, no nothing against following instructions, um, but but I tend to be a guy who just I like the idea of that meal. I've, I've got the concept of it. How do I make it and how do I make it work? I, I, I'm not a 40 grams of this, 50 grams of this, add the water, stir, you know. That, that's some people and I really respect that. I, I'm just not very good at that. Um, so this is how I design all my meals is that we think about these four areas, the carbs, the proteins, the flavors and the vegetables. And um, and, and that's the basis for your meals. There's a fifth element that's not noted here, which is the process, the, the method of cooking, um, but um, which can actually change it quite significantly. You can have the same ingredients and end up with quite a different meal, uh, like a risotto versus a fried rice, for example. Um, but this is the basic idea. So for, right, for, for carbs, think about, um, you know, you've got um, polenta, um, you've got, rice noodles, um, you've got rice, you've got pasta, uh, you've got um, well, couscous. Um, there, there's heaps of different types of um, uh, carbs that you can have. Um, so, uh, and as a general rule, um, between 80 and 100 grams of dry um, carbs um, is enough per person. Um, uh, and then uh, and then, and then the rest comes in the proteins. Um, you can come, obviously, the, there's lots of vegetarian options in terms of nuts and cheese uh, and tofu's. Um, tuna, um, you can get these sachets of tuna. I need to switch off my background blurry thing, don't I? Uh, choose virtual background, none. Done. There we go. Um, so these sort of um, sachets are great, for sh particularly for shorter trips. On a longer trip, once you're out for more than a week, uh, these start to add up in terms of weight. But for a shorter trip, these are quite great um, and a really nice, easy source of protein. And you, you can get different flavours of tuna. You can get salmon and you can get chicken really easily in Woolworths or Coles or Audi or IGA or whatever is your is your place. So um, these make really good um, simple protein ads as well. And then flavors, you've got your, your chicken stocks, your curry paste, your tomato pastes, um, um, coconut milk powder is just gold. Um, and of course you've got your, um, anyway, I'm not gonna read the whole page, you can read through them. But here you can see, um, you know, we just bring in these different things. And then for a veggie risotto, um, um, it's the same thing, but we're just, you know, we're bringing in rice, we're cooking it slightly differently, we're bringing in some cheese, we're bringing in some chicken stock, and we're just dumping a whole bunch of veggies in there. With the veggies, um, you can buy a lot of these directly from Woolworths. All this stuff here is, is straight from a supermarket. Um, so, you know, you can uh, get your sur surprise peas. I hope nobody minds me mentioning brands. Um, you can get dried corn um, and dried mushrooms very easily. Um, you chuck them in there with um, uh, even a powdered, um, stock um, and you can cook that on the track. Um, we'll talk a bit later about the idea of prepping this and dehydrating it at home. Um, and here we've got pasta, we've got parmesan cheese, we're chucking some 
bacon bits um, and, um, and we'll chuck in some veggies as well. Um, and we've got a, a, a nice simple pasta meal. Um, and um, here's a tuna um, and couscous salad. Um, so uh, um, these, these sort of tuna, these couscous salads are really great, particularly for summer uh, meals. Um, you can actually um, hydrate couscous uh, with cold water. It takes a lot longer. I tend to do it with hot water and just let it sit um, and then um, have a cooler um, or a lukewarm uh, salad um, type meal um, uh, in the warmer, warmer seasons when we've warmer walks. Um, drinks. Here's my kids on the overland. Um, water's great. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with just enjoying uh, fresh water in the wilderness. Um, um, but I find I personally don't drink enough um, on trips. So I tend to add uh, flavors partly to increase my energy intake. So um, partly uh, to just increase my water intake um, and partly just because I get a bit bored of water because I'm, I don't know, a spoiled kid, I guess. But anyway, um, so a hot chocolates um, are just gold, I think, on trips. I'm a hot chocolate guy. Um, so I tend to have a hot chocolate in the morning on cold trips um, and um, love to basically boil up some water when I get into camp and have um, uh, have a hot chocolate while I'm preparing dinner and that sort of stuff. Um, teas and coffees are obviously popular with a lot of people. Uh, iced tea powders, I thought I brought everything in, but I didn't. Uh, you can buy from Coles um, little sachets uh, or Woolworths, little sachets of uh, iced tea. Um, so it's, I think it makes maybe 400 um, mils or something. So you just empty the sachet in, add some water, it's basically sugar and ice. Um, tea flavour um, and um, I, I really like that I doubt a lot of water doing that uh, powdered cordials are good sports drinks are good for for some people I actually get migraines um, from some sports drinks so um, I, I tend not to have a lot of them um, and, but uh, but they're certainly popular out on track and a great way to get a lot of energy um, and some extra micronutrients in you um, particularly on those warmer trips where you're going through a lot of water. Um, and I mentioned earlier, powdered soups are really popular. Um, Alcohol is always an option um, for walks as well, um, particularly those more lazy walks. Um, tends to be, if you're going to carry alcohol, um, um, I, I tend to put it in, you can get the little, like the platypus uh, uh, bags, you can get specific wine ones, um, but any of those sort of flexible um, screw top plastic bag type um, um, water carrying devices. Um, uh, you, you can just use a pet bottle, um, get a 600 mil uh, soft drink bottle, empty it out, wash it out, drink it preferably, um, uh, wash it out and then use that for carrying alcohol. Um, uh, port is great. Some of your spirits are great to carry. Wine is uh, nice, but very heavy. Um, um, so you tend to go, um, you yeah, your high content alcohol uh, for trips. Um, I personally don't drink a lot. I don't carry a lot. Um, and I'd certainly discourage people from drinking excess uh, on any walk, especially an MPA walk. Um, um, but sometimes it's nice to sit around um, in the evening and just have a, you know, sh share a bit of port. Um, so that's great. Um, uh, and think again, uh, if you're having those drinks, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to um, drink it? What sort of cups you need? Um, breakfasts. Let's talk breakfasts. Um, I tend to keep breakfast really simple. I tend to go um, porridges. So these sort of instant porridges, um, they say on the, uh, on the back of these that you need to put them on a stove and stir them uh, for 90 seconds um, um, with milk and all these other things. Um, you don't need to. So what I do is empty one of these uh, into a cup or into my um, little bowl I have here. Um, and I add some powdered milk. I add a teaspoon of powdered milk, sorry, a tablespoon of powdered milk, uh, um, a little bit of sugar because I'm a sweet tooth, um, and then add some boiling water to it, stir it, and just let it sit for a couple of minutes. Um, and it, it's great to eat after probably two minutes or so. Um, I find that there's a bit of research into chia seeds, 
Um, chia seeds are a great way of reducing the GI, um, the glycemic index of sugary foods. It does mean that um, the glucose is slow to release. So having chia seeds in there um, does actually give you a little bit of extra, um, uh, stretches the, the, the energy release out over a longer time. Um, uh, breakfast bars are great for those uh, people who are into such things. Um, it, it makes the, the morning much easier. You might just have a brekkie bar while you're sitting in your sleeping bag. Um, um, uh, my kids, one of my kids love them. Um, uh, and cereal is also popular. I tend to do a toasted muesli. Again, a tablespoon of um, powdered milk, a little bit of sugar, add a splash of water and stir it. And, and that's what you're looking at there. Um, I tend to get one with mixed dried fruits in it. Um, you can always add extra dried fruit uh, to it. Um, and, and that just makes a really simple, particularly helpful one for summers, for summertime. Um, now, uh, powdered milk is just fantastic. You can get these little UHT um, containers, uh, which are good, but they're really heavy. So I'm, I'm powdered milk all the time. Um, so I tend to put um, all the powdered milk I need into a snaplock bag and carry that. Um, and for some trips, I'll actually have the cereal um, that I'm having in a snack lock bag with the powdered milk and a little bit of sugar in there all ready to go. And so in my sleeping bag, I'll just add a little bit of water, splash it and actually eat out of the bag, um, um, particularly for those mornings where it's raining or something like that, where I just want to be able to um, get going without having to do the washing up. Um, I then rinse the bag out uh, at lunchtime. Um, turn it inside out, dry it, and then I can reuse it for my next trip. A couple of pro tips um, when you've got a little bit more time on a trip. Um, making yogurt. Um, oh, man, I've got so much stuff here. I've lost it. Um, easy Yo. There, there's, if you go into your Coles or Woolworths, um, they don't tend to sell them at Audi, but there's um, uh, yogurt. It's basically, uh, I think it's Easy Yo is what it's called. It's a... Um, it's about 100 grams of powder, which is mostly milk powder, and, um, and it's got the yogurt culture in it. So I tend to do, take half of that. One of those makes a litre. Um, I take half of one of those um, and put it into a 500 mil plastic uh, um, large mouth uh, water bottle um, and add warm water to it, mixing it up. And so you fill up half a litre um, with water. And so you've got this milk mixture um, and you do this at night. I then boil up a litre of water. Um, or not quite a litre, but boil up some water. And then you rest this whole bottle inside a billy of water that's been boiled, but no longer in the boil. And it gently warms up the, um, the yogurt culture. Um, and that gets up you get that up to about 45, 50-ish degrees. You don't want to get it much hotter than that, otherwise you'll kill it. Um, and then double checking, the lid's nicely secured. Um, I dry it off, uh, wrap it in a, uh, a tea towel and then put it in my sleeping bag uh, when I go to bed um, and leave it in my sleeping bag until, I don't know, until I wake up at some wee hour of the morning. Um, and, and the yogurt's full. So you've got a hard yogurt overnight. And then, so I take it out of my sleeping bag put it just outside um, at the edge of my tent or just outside my tent um, and it cools down uh, in the last hour of the morning. And so you've got a half a litre of uh, yogurt and it's fantastic. And you can get lots of different flavours. Um, but again, I tend to do that on lazier trips when you've got the time. Uh, and for those who like eggs, um, there's um, a few different companies out there uh, that do what they call dry crystals uh, of eggs. And they taste really good. They taste like normal eggs. Uh, you tend to do a tablespoon of eggs, um, about a tablespoon of water, um, mix it together and, and, and you can cook scrambled eggs and that sort of stuff. You can dehydrate your own eggs and we can talk a bit about that later if people are interested. But breakfasts are a good way to start the day. Um, lunches. Oh, I need to speed things up a bit. Um, so there, there's three kind of lunches um, that I think of, sandwich styles, um, sort of packet meals, sort of like, like a dinner style lunch. Um, and then snack, snack and move. So you, um, so sandwich style is what we tend to do. But so Vita Wheats, Vita Wheats, I obviously can't spell, um, uh, a great uh, flatbread wraps are really good. English muffins I tend to do for the first 
a few days of a walk, probably sort of the first two or three days. Bread rolls I love for the first day. Um, and there's also all your dense um, nut type breads that are out there. Um, generally, I go between four and six Vita Wheats. Um, and then on top of that, you know, these sort of sachets are really good. Uh, peanut butter is great. Um, um, some salami is good. Uh, cheese, you can carry a lot of cheeses. Like cheese like Edam um, lasts really well out of the fridge for, um, you know, in cooler climates, not in hot climates, but, but, but not, you know, if you're in Tassie or um, walking outside of summer in most of Australia, uh, something like an Edam will last quite well um, for about four or five days outside uh, refrigeration. Uh, again, wrap it up, stick it in the center of your pack. Um, um, yeah, so I tend to go uh, peanut butter and tuna. I know it sounds gross, but it works. Um, um, and, um, but you can, you can do whatever sort of spreads you want. Some people uh, do more salad -y type things for the first few days. Uh, the packet meals, these sort of things have just come out recently and becoming quite popular. Um, uh, these are the, the sort of whole grain uh, mixes that you can get. So they tend to be uh, a mix of either a rice or a, a, a bean or a, a um, you know, different types of uh, proteins with, um, so this one's got chickpeas and tuna uh, and some different lentils uh, and that sort of stuff in it. And, and you, you just rip it open and eat it straight uh, from the container. Um, one of those is um, probably a, a, a lunch for, for one person, um, but, but they're, they're quite good. Um, and you can always cook up a, a main meal type thing um, with noodles or something like that for, for a lunch um, uh, if you're so inclined. Um, snacks. Okay. Uh, muesli bars are really popular. Scrogrins, so that's your mix of um, peanuts and lollies and um, M&Ms and, and uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, some dried fruit in there. That's quite popular. I actually don't like, I mean, I like scrogrin. It's delicious. I tend to not use scrogrin, scrogrin a lot these days, uh, particularly if it's raining. I just find it a real hassle. Um, so I tend to go the muesli bars um, and dried fruit as my main sort of snack on the go. Um, corn chips, again, really nice and popular. Shouldn't have got plenty of water. Um, and when I'm walking with kids, um, uh, I love to freshly cook popcorn um, as, a, as a sort of afternoon tea, particularly on longer days of walks where you just need that, that, that energy boost. Um, so uh, I, I cook it in my jet boil. The instructions make it very clear in the jet boil. You should never do such a thing, but, but, um, but any gas stove, it's, it's relatively easy. Um, tiny little bit of oil, one layer of seeds at the bottom um, and gently heat it, lowest heat you possibly can. Um, and then um, once it starts popping, keep it stirring uh, and it fills up quite quick. Um, I carry just a little bit of um, um, salt to stick on the top of that as well. And then your hot chocolates and soups. Okay, happy hours. We're going to get to meals very soon. Um, I'm a big fan of happy hour um, uh, to be able to chat and um, um, share, um, you know, just to, to meet other walkers, that sort of stuff. Uh, so this is uh, a happy hour. We had three or four nights into a walk. Um, so these little wheels of cheese, um, I freeze them before I leave. Um, partly because it makes it much easier to carry that you can't crush them while they're frozen, uh, but it gives you a few extra days of being able to carry them. Um, so they freeze well, wrap them up in a t-shirt and shove them in your bag. Um, and crackers um, are easy to um, squash. So watch how you pack these things. Um, but, but it's a really nice way to meet people. And um, so, you know, again, you can do a platter with your, all, all the other stuff that we talked about earlier. Um, so again, it depends on your goal really encourage happy hours. Um, it doesn't even have to have the port. Okay, dinners, let's do this. Um, so these, um, these are, here, here's some really basically simple meals that you don't need to think of too much about. They're easy to uh, purchase and they're um, relatively easy to cook. Um, so uh, these sort of continental pasta and sauce mixes, um, this is your sort of classic scout um, meal. Um, so they're super easy. They're lightweight. Cleaning's a bit of a pain afterwards, um, but all the everything's in there. I tend to add a bit of powdered milk to it. 
um, and you use up all your water. So you, you put it in your pot, you empty the packet into your pot, throw in a bit of powdered milk, throw in your water, cook it on a relatively low temperature, stir it, lots of energy. Um, and I tend to add, you know, carry something like a carrot or a, um, an onion and cut it up and shove it in there um, to, to just give you that extra bit of flavor. Um, and if you're feeding two people, take two packets um, and, and it scales up quite well. This dried ravioli is my go-to meal that I do a lot. Um, um, you can only get this. I can't remember. I think it's Woolworths. Either Woolworths or Coles is the only one that stocked this. I'm pretty sure it's Woolworths. Um, uh, but this is the dried ravioli. It's cheese filled. Um, and you, um, you heat it up. Uh, sorry, you, you boil water, you chuck it in the water. It only needs to be in boiling water for about three minutes um, and it rehydrates and, and there's cheese in there. So I um, have a handful of that, about, um, uh, I don't know, about eight, 80 grams of those. Um, and um, usually throw in some dried veggies beforehand to, to soak it up, boil those, throw in the tortellinis. Um, I call it ravioli, it's tortellini. Um, sorry about that. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I tend to put in one of those salami sticks and some tomato paste or um, just another one of these sort of packets. Really quick, really easy. Um, washing ups, um, there's hardly any because um, the whole thing's in boiling water. So you're not getting stuff sticking to the bottom of the pot. Um, so nice, really easy one and, and easy to do for larger groups as well. Um, so again, so the next one is keeping it really simple with something like one of these packets uh, for your meal. Uh, you might want to just add a few extra things to it, like a carrot or something to make it a little bit more exciting. Um, and then the last one is uh, getting your packet of tuna and then something like um, a dead potato. I've got it somewhere here. I can't find it, but some um, uh, instant mashed potato um, and some veggies through it. Um, mix it through. Nice and easy, not a lot of prep um, and easy to cook in camp. Um, some more involved meals from uh, supermarkets. You can do risotto. There's instant risotto mixes, um, but you can also just uh, DIY your own ingredients. They tend to be nice and lightweight and pretty high energy. Uh, luxes are always a good one. Uh, the picture here is of a luxa soup. I'll, I'd actually do a, a concentrated luxa paste um, and um, yeah rice noodles, um, throw in some of those dried veggies uh, that we talked about earlier, um, and, um, uh, and, and some meat of some sort. Salami is always a nice, easy one for, for luxa. Um, and you can always do stir fries. Um, so some, um, cook up some rice, take some um, easy to carry veggies like your carrots and that sort of stuff, uh, cook those up, throw in some sauce, uh, and, um, and so for stir fry. Okay, dehydrating, sorry. I'll push through this next little bit. Um, uh, dehydrating at home. So uh, do it is my short answer. If you do any trips that are longer than um, three or four days, um, or, or if you do a lot of weekend walks, it's just really worth getting a dehydrator. You can get them online relatively cheap. Um, and basically it's just a hot um, air blower heater that goes over, over the meat. There's lots of information online. I'm not going to give you a full how to do dehydrating here, but it significantly increases the life of your food. So you can take meat, this mince in the background is, is one of my go-to meals. Um, um, so you no longer need to refrigerate it. It's really lightweight. So this mince in the background, um, a kilo of that dries down to about 250 grams. Um, so heaps lighter um, and much easier to carry. Uh, you get to flavor them as you want. It's much lower cost. So when you cook a meal at home, um, just cook a bit extra um, and chuck it in the dehydrator. Uh, it's really easy in the field because you don't need to cook it. Um, um, it's already cooked. So you're just throwing in hot water um, and giving it sort of 10 to 15 minutes to rehydrate. Uh, if you want, you can dry the ingredients separate um, and then you've got some dried veggies and you've got some dried onion and you can mix and match uh, stuff as you go uh, and make design the meal afterwards. Um, so a few tips. Um, I always dehydrate my rice and pasta. And I know that sounds ridiculous because you already buy it dry. Um, but here's my 
pile of rice. Um, and I'll show you some of it here if I can. Um, it's uh, so this is cooked and then dehydrated. And the reason why I do this is that in the field, all I need to do is add water um, and it's ready. You don't need to cook it for 10 or 15 minutes and use up all that fuel and end up with the mess of rice. Um, you're literally just adding hot water um, to it. And, and if your stove fails, you can just add cold water and, and it's perfectly fine after 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and same as for pasta. Now pasta is a bit more tricky it gets really sh extra sharp and uh, things like um, spaghetti become harder to handle. Uh, avoid dehydrating anything with high fat content or high sugar content. They just don't dehydrate well um, and don't last long uh, as well. Cut things small, less than a centimetre is ideal. Uh, minced meat um, is one of the things that people struggle with the most um, because when it rehydrates, it, they, they call it rock um, or gravel uh, in America. Um, but the trick with it is when you cook it, cook it with something really starchy like lentils, um, which bulks it up a bit, but the starch gets through the mince when you're cooking it. Um, and if you throw in something like a tin of tomatoes as well, um, that when it comes to rehydrate, it rehydrates really well. And it's almost as good as your um, mince at home. Still got a little bit of a little bit of extra texture to it that you wouldn't expect at home, but it's, it's really close. Um, chicken is tricky. Uh, the best way to do chicken is tinned chicken. It dehydrates and rehydrates really well. Uh, otherwise, you need to use a pressure cooker at home. So chicken's a bit of a specialty, um, but, but if you've got tinned chicken, uh, it works a treat. Okay, so some dinners. Uh, if you're going to start with dehydrating, uh, risotto is great. Just cook up a risotto, spread it out, dry it, um, and it's, it's super easy and it's super delicious uh, on a walk. And I tend to do uh, my risottos with tin chicken, uh, veggies um, and, and the rice. Um, nachos and burritos are really popular. On the right hand side, I tend to always start my walks off with a big tray of nachos. Um, so I just carry in a couple of bags of uh, chips, uh, rehydrate the mince, put it on and um, spread over some cheese. Um, and uh, if you give it a little bit longer, the cheese melts a little bit, not a lot. Um, spaghetti bolognese is um, nice and easy to do. You do the mince and you can either pre-cook the spaghetti or cook it on track. Um, curries and rice. I carry this sort of my, I carry little bags like that. So that's my uh, a chicken tikka uh, curry. Um, uh, the, you know, so, so that's sort of pre-packed and I'll, I'll take that. And chow mein is nice and easy. So it's, uh, you cook a, a mince at home um, with some veggies and then you do some noodles on track, mix it all together. And, it, and it's a really nice, easy meal. This is more of a tease slide. We don't have a lot of time to go into it, uh, but you can get really carried away. So pizzas you can do, um, um, some, some of them are a bit creative. You can get a uh, lightweight, uh, portable ovens uh, that you carry. Um, you can do pizza pockets. You can do bread rolls. So the way I do a bread roll is you make the bread as you would normally with um, uh, flour and yeast. Um, but instead of uh, cooking it in an oven, uh, I should put it in one of those freezer bags, uh, put it in um, in my in boiling water um, and just rest it in uh, simmering water for about 15 minutes and you've got a bread roll. Same thing works uh, for muffins um, or, or cake as well. Sushi and nori rolls, um, I, I really love um, um, and they're quite popular. So again, I cook the rice beforehand, uh, dehydrate it. Um, I use powdered um, uh, vinegar, a little bit of sugar, um, rehydrate the rice on track. Um, and for this trip, this tuna that you see here was actually uh, a tin tuna that I dehydrated at home and then rehydrated on the trip. Um, and that's a chicken down the bottom as well. Uh, Noki works. Um, uh, you can do Noki. It, it's heavier. Um, so it's, it's one that you'd use on the first couple of nights. Uh, fried rice um, is in theory easy, um, but, but the stirring of it in a billy is quite tricky. Um, so it, it's a good one once you're sort of looking for something new as well. Uh, desserts are good. Uh, custards. Um, again, you can do custards straight in your billy or in a plastic bag. Uh, mix the custard powder, the water, stick it in a plastic bag, in a freezer bag, um, simmer it away um, in, in, your, in your billy, um, and you can make a really thick yogurt. Um, uh, uh, if you're getting into dehydrating, one of the first things you should do 
is uh, apple slices. So get a tin of apples uh, and dehydrate it. And ah, here it is. That bag is four tins of apples um, dehydrated. Um, they, they shrink right up and they're, uh, they're great and they rehydrate really well. Um, and so I'll tend to rehydrate some apple, um, throw over some, um, some muesli on top of that um, and make a custard. And you've got a, a lazy man's apple crumble. Again, you can do the muffins and cakes like I mentioned earlier. You can do puddings. Uh, uh, there's cheesecakes that you can buy in uh, the supermarkets, um, uh, which are an instant cheesecake, where you've got a, a base, uh, crumbs base, and a cheese mixture, um, cheesecake-ish mixture that you put on top. Um, and they, they work really well, serve sort of four or five people. Um, and of course, rice puddings uh, and the like. Um, so I know that I've pushed the time and I've rushed that last little bit so we can get to questions, um, but extra information, uh, bushwalking101.org, got to plug MPA's most awesome site. Um, but on the right-hand side there, you can see we've got these PDFs that you can download and they've got all the, all the ingredients. So if you want to follow recipes, they're there. We pulled it off um, and we've got... Um, um, split into similar, similar sort of categories that we've mentioned here. We've got lunches, um, breakfasts and dinners, um, and we've got fancy ones and easy ones. Um, on the left-hand side is a link to Extreme Gourmet, um, which is a book written by Sonia who lives in the Blue Mountains. Um, and um, she really goes into a lot of detail about um, uh, food and nutrition and the whys and the hows. It's really awesome. Um, and then some really practical recipes, especially if you want to step things up a bit. Um, questions? All right. Thanks, Matt. That was brilliant. And it was, um, it, you certainly convinced us that um, life's too short for bad food. And to the extent <laughs> that we're sort of starting to wonder about your motivations for going walking, in truth. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all about food. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gourmet adventure. Um, you, you did leave us with a couple of slightly disturbing um, images, I guess. Um, one was the idea of you making porridge in your sleeping bag. There was also <laughs> in, the, in the chat a strange speculation about what Sam Garrett Jones does with specimen bottles. But I think the one that I found most disturbing was tin chicken, which I must admit, I've never um, in my lifetime uh, crossed over the concept of tin chicken. Um, look, before I, I, I sort of open up to questions, a couple of things I wanted to ask you. One is there was a vast amount of chat about on the subject of powdered milk, but what I didn't see in any of that was any comment about alternatives for those who are lactose intolerant. Yep. And of course, the other issue was that all of your, or almost all of your um, recipes were very dependent upon water and whether yeah. you wanted to actually make some comment about uh, how you secure um, appropriate potable water um, as part of your meal preparations. Yeah, great. Uh, so in terms of alternatives for powdered milk, uh, coconut milk's a, a very popular one. You okay. can get powdered coconut milk. Um, uh, if you go to the Asian section of supermarkets, I don't think they call it an Asian section anymore. I think, anyway, um, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, you'll find uh, powdered coconut milk. It comes in a box and I think there's three or four sachets in each one of those. Um, so that's quite popular. Um, there are soy type powdered milks around uh, if you go to health stores, um, but it, they are hard to pick up. But the coconut milk is the is is the popular one there. Um, in terms of water, so uh, if you've got plenty of water, um, then treating it. I tend to use a UV um, treatment system, um, but probably the filtering is um, more popular. If you're going to be boiling the water, then you obviously don't need to treat it beforehand. You just boil it um, and, and, and that will be the treatment system. Water availability is a tricky one. So it depends on the walk. I carry um, a, I really need to clean up my desk. Here we go. Um, I carry a water carrying bag. Um, this thing is, carries five litres quite easily, but weighs, I don't know, it's like 50 grams or something. Um, so I usually have a couple of those in my bag, even if there's water nearby. Um, I tend to go and fill that up, carry it easily. Um, and um, so I'm not constantly going back and forth to the creek. Um, so if there's water available after lunch, I'll fill it up and carry that. 
Um, if it's something like Larapinta where you might have to carry water for a few days, uh, then I tend to use meals more like this than dehydrated ones because they've already got the water in it and you've got to carry it anyway. Um, so, so these sort of things, uh, and again, these sort of tunery things are really good options uh, for that um, because not all the water, you know, most of the water that we consume is not by drinking, it's by eating. Um, so if it's already mixed into the food, that's fine. The other thing I'd like to say is about tin food. Don't be, you know, we're scared of using tins because of, um, you know, we're always told that tins are bad. Um, tins these days are much lighter than they used to be. Um, and so carrying a tin food, the weight of it is actually the contents of it, which is the water. So if you're going somewhere like Larapinta um, on a couple of sections of Larapinta or, or, or where, where it is hot and dry, then tin food is actually not your enemy. That it can be quite a good thing. Um, obviously, you've got to carry the tin out, um, but but they're surprisingly light options as well. Yep. Is that yes, Matt? Yep. Uh, question from Di: Do you use a special sealer machine? Yeah. Okay. So I've got a, a vacuum um, sealer. It's just a Breville, like you know, it was just one I got secondhand off eBay, um, and um, that you get these plastic bags, there's a lot of plastic I know, um, and uh, vacuum pack, and then um, it, it has a heat seal across the top. Um, and uh, that it, it helps for a couple of reasons. One is getting the air, oxygen out uh, increases the life of this thing, um, but it also means that your, um, your food's not absorbing water from the atmosphere if you keep it elsewhere so you don't need that um, if um, before I had that and for a very long time I just put stuff into a snap lock bag and then actually just left it in the bottom of my fridge until I needed it um, because that spoiling that happens from oxygen is really slow in colder temperatures um, and um, if you're only out for you know a week it, it's absolutely fine in a snap lock bag the only Downs, one of the downsides of dehydrating is food gets really sharp. So uh, things like rice and pasta in particular and meat um, gets really sharp edges. Um, so if I'm putting um, a reasonable amount into one of these bags, I actually put it into a brown paper bag first in here and then vacuum seal it um, so that the, the plastic doesn't get pierced. Otherwise you end up with um, bags like this that you've lost a vacuum from. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Matt, when you refer to a jet boil, do you have a particular size or system that you'd recommend? Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend a jet boil. I, I like it because they work really well for me. So for when I'm cooking for a group. So I have the, not the small one, the medium one. So it's a, the, you can boil, I think it's a half a litre in it, but the whole thing is one litre. Um, and um, that works, you know, it's really, the kids can operate it. They're, they're pretty bomb proof. They're nice and easy. They're ridiculously efficient with gas. Um, so you can boil, I think it's a litre of water with about uh, five grams of gas. So, um, so for a trip like the Overland, where I was feeding seven people um, over 10 days, did it with one jet boil, and I think just two small canisters of gas. You know, they're ridiculously efficient. Um, and that's doing breakfast, lunch, and dinners. Um, um, when I'm walking, I actually, uh, when it's just me, I tend to carry just a, a little um, titanium stove top that I screw onto a gas bottle, um, and then a titanium mug with about 300 mils uh, that I put on top of that. Um, sometimes I'll just light a little fire, depending on where I'm walking, whether that's going to be appropriate, and just um, my stove on top of that. So um if you're looking for something really nice and easy um that you don't have to think about that always works that then i think jet boil is a really good option um, yeah. yeah thanks all right so um i'll ask our final question in just a second but i do want to let everyone know that next week brian everingham um president of our southern sydney branch is going to be talking about uh the orchids in his corner of the world which is um on one hand, Southern Sydney and the, you know parks like Royal and Heathcote, but um, I'm not sure that there's actually anyone who'd be better travelled to the parks of New South Wales than Brian Everingham. So it might be um, a little bit more than what you might think about the corner. Um, 
Matt, the most hotly contested question in the chat was around uh, recipes for scroggin. So um, <laughs> just wondering if you might put your bit on the table. Um, I'm a sweet tooth and I love salty. So I always go um, all the stuff that you shouldn't do. Salted peanuts, um, because I just love the salt. Um, I tend to go um, the jubes. I tend to go smarties um, and uh, dried fruit um, throughout. Um, but again, I don't do it a lot because I just, I find scrogging just a hassle when it's wet or um, when I'm tired and stuff. So I tend to go the muesli bars and stuff. Um, but but I'm a sweet and salty guy, so I do everything that's wrong. And I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, look, Matt, on that enticing note, we might call tonight's proceedings to an end. Just want to thank everyone for attending and most especially to thank Matt for being so generous with your expertise and um, providing such wonderful entertainment. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. See ya. Bye.